The other uh, folks, in addition to the mentors that you guys uh, got us connected to, was huge for us. Um, coming from a small country and getting that visibility and that access to resource was very, very important for us. And for the twofold, the second piece, in addition to the technical assistance, was also the mentorship on you know the business model and how we can make a, a, a greater or a, a stronger business model for the to, for us to. Sustain. And then um, again, back to the impact metrics because we're also a company really focused on impact. And the impact mentorship was also very key for us to really understand like how do we position ourselves and how do we look at the impact metrics and how could we try to find follow on impact uh, investment. So I think that was um, very, very um, helpful for us. And, um, you know, um, the open source piece and the digital public good, like we were very new to that project process and um, the UNICEF team literally held our hands to walk us through that path and, um, and now we're a proud um, registered DPG solution. So that has also been um, very, very amazing for us. So thank you. Great. Um, yeah, I, like there's a lot of mentorship that goes on. I hope that there's also like support as well. You know, the mentorship is almost like the technical um, you know, uh, guidance, I suppose. But I hope that there's, there's some support because I want to kind of pivot over to my next question for Amia, which is really about some of the challenges that you face. And like, so you get technical mentorship, but tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced as you tried to, you know, bring about this product for impact uh, in the real world. So <laughs> there was a lot of challenges. <laughs> Because especially when you connect the smart contracts to the real world, uh, it's a totally different story. If you are building, um, I don't know, decentralized exchange or something like that, it's like in a closed loop, you are still in Ethereum. You are just communicating with other smart contracts, even I don't know if it's a lending protocol um, exchange or whatever. Usually the data is like um, that you need for those smart contracts are on the blockchain. But when you're building something like Treasure, you are, you are connecting with, uh, you're interacting with, uh, the smart contracts interacting with real humans, like uh, they need to provide data. Um, so one side is the technical limitations and some of the shortcomings of the blockchain technology that we have, like civil attacks, like, um, um, many things that, I mean, the problem of oracles, uh, these things exist, and for many of them, uh, there is no uh, big solution so far, even right now. So that was one side of the challenges that we had. The other side was actually, uh, like, the challenges that, you know, are there when you want to introduce a high-tech solution to a community that didn't know about it, local communities in rural areas, and they don't need to know about it. You, don't, you, you shouldn't force them to know about like blockchain. And it's even better not to mention that they're using blockchain because it makes it complicated, so many new questions. So what we tried to do on this side was to make it so easy for them to use the project. So just to have a recap of the project, we connect donors to uh, local communities who do conservation work, protect forests. Uh, the protocol uh, gives a proof of impact, impact in the form of an NFT to the donor. And on the other side, the money goes to the protocol and is managed um, in a similar way to an escrow system. Whenever they provide updates from the forest, from the trees, a portion of the money is unlocked and goes to their non-custodial wallet, wherever they are. Um, and um, that's how Twitter protocol works, the version one of the protocol, of course, we are doing a lot of more things. So to do this, um, I mean, to get the rewards for conservation, I mean, um, 
we try to make it a um, similar experience to their Web2 experience, like, like having a WhatsApp, Instagram uh, application on their mobile. Uh, so we built an application uh, which has integrated uh, some seed phraseless wallets non-custodial wallets, they don't have seed phrases, they don't need to know about the complex uh, nature of wallets in blockchain, so they use their email, but it's non-custodial, we use Web3 Auth for that. At the same time, we sponsor all their transactions on the supply side for local communities. We use uh, stable coins um, instead of um, volatile assets like Ethereum, Bitcoin, so uh, they get their um, conservation rewards in DAI. And many, many other works, like I, many of them I forget, but this was actually one of the most uh, challenging parts of our job to um, make it like, because it's actually important, like we had it, one of the things that we learned is that um, some of our early local communities that were using a buggy and both complicated profile uh, left the um, actually the movements, the project, because it was too complicated for them. And the more we try to make it better for them, user-friendly, uh, the easier um, it was for them to stay in the project. And of course with UNICEF, we got a lot of in, um, in mentorship, like uh, referring to the impact mentorship. Uh, in the case of Treasure, it's not only about planting trees, because we onboard the local communities are who are less privileged, who have uh, less access um, to um, actually the typical opportunities in climate finance. So it's about social impact as well. That's why we actually um, have that kind of social impact in the project as well and the impact mentorships help, helped us uh, quantify, uh, measure those impact. So we learn uh, what we're doing like um, in a better way. And of course, the open source, um, like this is uh, one of the best um, things that you can get out of this um, um, investment because you think you are open source, but you are not like an uh, open source friendly project. So lots of documentation, contribution guidelines, um, many, many things like I think it was awesome, like that, that part, like uh, now we feel confident about like being a good open source project. Even if the project fails, the resources, everything are there in a good way for the future builders to use. Yeah, that's it. Great. Um, lots of challenges. Um, congratulations on getting through all those challenges and, and really thanks very much for putting out such an amazing product of, of benefit for, for everyone with the conservation that it supports. Um, that, that kind of like something that benefits people all around the world, even if it's done in local communities, makes me think of equity, which is one of you know, the key lenses that UNICEF, UNICEF is an equity-based organization. Everything we think about, we use equity as a kind of a lens for that. And, and one of the ways that we think about digital products and how we make them equitable is digital public goods, which is my next, my next question for, is for you, Jose. Um, first of all, sorry, I should say congratulations to each of you uh, for becoming a certified digital public good, which is very impressive and challenging to, to get done. Um, but Jose, will you tell us a little bit about Excapits and your journey to becoming a certified DPG um, how did UNICEF support you um, in that process? I, I mean, I know it's somewhat through the mentorship, but um, what kind of benefit then, like after you talk a little bit about the process, what benefit do you see? And I know Armia mentioned a little bit some of the benefits of DPGs. What benefits do you see from your perspective? And even talk a little bit about maybe, you know, being a for-profit business with uh, an open digital public goods. Okay, that's a whole question. Yeah. So I will try to, to wrap up everything or I will try not to forget part of it. Uh, but the starting point for was uh, thinking about building a digital public good that could achieve uh, the sustainable goals from UN. So from starting point, I think that 
having on board all of the support of UNICEF Innovation Fund had to do, first of all, about thinking on the impact, thinking about the resources, thinking about leaving something that could be scalable, that could be secure, that could be useful for some other products so as to use. So, uh, first of all, I would say that becoming an open source project has to do with uh, developing a layer in which other people could build. So, uh, from that starting point, UNICEF was amazing. Um, and having the impact uh, in, in the main objectives of building a digital product has to do with, uh, first of all, measuring it. Uh, theory of change was one of the men mentorships and uh, it's amazing how you could measure your impact uh, on a region. And actually, that's, that's uh, a profitable digital public good. Uh, a company that could create lasting and social economic impact. And uh, coming from Latin America, that's a huge depth of the region. So for us, it was uh, easy to, to like have that purpose, but still difficult or challenging to build it in a way that could be useful for everybody. So uh, at last but not least, I think that uh, every project should be sustainable and should be um, profitable in terms of creating value. And creating value has much to do not only with revenue or uh, incomes, but having these things in mind, if you could align your project so as to build it with values and uh, having in front people that have needs and if you could fulfill those needs through, through a technological solution, that's great. And uh, just to mention some objectives of uh, digital public good, we have no poverty, uh, gender equality, quality education, no poverty, those are like huge North Stars to have. And uh, an invitation that should be done on every entrepreneur that is building their, their venture, it's to, to continue tackling those objectives. Uh, it's a huge rock that we need to defeat. It's not one or two companies who will make it come true. It's uh, and that, this has to do with Web3 too. Web3, 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 it's a matter of community. And this is so loud, loud voice in, and in an ecosystem as Web3 uh, that first of all makes me proud to be part of it, makes me wanna collaborate uh, with other projects that are tackling the same problems and uh, joining forces, I'm, I'm sure about that. Uh, it will be more fulfillable than going just by my own. So uh, just uh, in a rough uh, synthesis, I think that that's what uh, left us to become a digital public good. It's great. Um, and I, I like that you brought out the aspect of community as well, seeing as we're here at like DevCon and there's a very strong kind of feeling of community around the, like the technology, but also like the, the problems that some people are, are looking to solve. And, and for, for us as UNICEF and for me, like it's, it's exciting and it's inspiring and energizing to get that feel of community and hopefully being able to like get people to come and join us in our, in our journey and in our work. But yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll maybe try and talk a little bit about so we talked about the DPG process, the process of um, you know, joining the Venture Fund, your, your, your journey with the Venture Fund. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about real world now. It's, it was part of the, uh, the title. So taking, you've gone through, you've joined the Venture Fund, you've accepted, you've gone through, mentored. Now maybe I'll ask Rumi to tell us a little bit about um, the opportunity for piloting the actual product that you gain with, with UNICEF. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the real application now that we've gone through the process? 
Um, so we are currently in the midst of uh, piloting our solution Rahat with the country office, the UNICEF country office in Nepal. Uh, we are working on um, uh, with 1,500 households for an unconditional cash transfer of about, I think, $150,000 through the country office and the innovation fund. And uh, with that pilot, um, we are really looking at um, building or bringing in or bringing in uh, some learning insights about the impact of how a blockchain-powered solution can bring in efficiencies in the cash transfer project. So um, how, for example, real-time monitoring could help um, the country office um, um, understand uh, or um, understand how the cash is being transferred, understand the flow of funds, and get verifiable transactions. So, um, so we're, we're really looking at uh, working not just with the country office, like, but alongside um, with the local authorities and the government bodies there. So we are bringing them along for this particular pilot and getting them um, onboarded or uh, um, getting them um, to understand the process and really, um, as Ermia had said, like really not talking to them about what blockchain technology is, but really getting them and showing them the benefit of um, how they can use a system like this and get aid to the ones who need it the most um, efficiently, like cost effectively and um, in a very, um, uh, I think like an auditable way because with all of the financial reconciliation that happens in in these um, aspects, that's a huge uh, time and resource suck. So uh, we're looking at how the time and resources can be saved um, through this particular pilot and um, where we're trying to see if we can take all of the learnings from this particular pilot and replicate it, hopefully replicate it in other country offices and globally. So taking um, Rahat from a, a local, as almost like a local product from Nepal to sort of see how we can globally um, amplify it. So that's kind of where we're at with the pilot currently. And um, um, just as an example right now, like, you know, we've, we're sort of bringing uh, training the, the local government bodies and how they can use the dashboard, look at some real time information on how the transactions are coming through and how the data is coming through and sort of see if they can detect anomalies and escalate it immediately and act upon it. So um, giving them or showing them the value of what some information like that could support them to make a greater impact. Great, thank you. Um, I'm actually really excited, as you know, I'm very excited about this pilot. Um, I wonder, can you have a little reflection on, so you mentioned, you know, aside from your own company, you mentioned two other entities, you, you mentioned three actually, you mentioned UNICEF country office, you mentioned the government, and of course the beneficiaries. Can you maybe just speak a little bit about how uh, the innovation fund facilitated with the UNICEF country office the engagement with, with the government? Because that can be difficult if, you're, if you don't have that like evidence as yet. Right. Um, in Nepal, all of the cash transfer that we do, like we usually have to work with the government. So there's definitely the piece of onboarding them to understand, for them to understand and be open to it. So again, the, the, because again, because crypto is illegal, getting that or making them to understand the difference and that was definitely a little bit of a hurdle, but with the right um, concept and the right um, understanding with the Innovation Fund and the country office, we were able to have a number of uh, conversations with the local government and you know, in such real world cases at times, we are talking about emerging tech and you know, blockchain, and then here you are where everything is like paper based and, um, you know, and the beneficiaries, like, they don't even have, like they only have feature phones that they don't even have phones. So just making that leapfrogging to that is, is, was, is very difficult. And, um, and then getting even the local government to say, okay, this is a dashboard, you can get in, you can see all of the information. So that definitely is a, a challenge, but um, we are having these conversations to bringing them along one at a time. 
And the country office is definitely being, uh, playing a huge role as being part of uh, and joining us in the field as we have these conversations with the local government bodies and with the beneficiaries and really looking at some issues that are on the field where, you know, the, where the beneficiaries, there's a struggle between, okay, who's going to get the cash and they're like real world problems beyond the monitoring piece as well. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, that's great. Um, I, I, I'd actually love to talk more about, about this uh, particular topic. And I, I really, one thing I want to point out, like cash-based transfers is a huge uh, programmatic tool to basically get funds, get currency, get money directly to the beneficiaries, which is a, I've seen it in action. And it's really hugely effective, efficient, and important. And, we heard someone speak a little bit about subtraction yesterday in, um, in the opening ceremonies, and I, I feel, I would love to speak more about it, but I feel that cash-based transfers and using technologies to really speed them up and facilitate them kind of speaks to that subtraction. So thank you very much, and thanks for the great work that you're doing. Um, we have a few minutes left. What I'd really like to do now, actually, Armia, if I can ask you to be the first one, if you could take a couple of minutes to think about what kind of advice you would give to someone out here who's maybe in a startup situation and wants to become um, working in the impact area, or even if you were talking to yourself, you know, 18 months in the past or two years in the past, what, what kind of advice would you like to give to yourself or to our audience? So I would say that one of the most important things that, I mean, impact projects or impact founders like us need to consider or the challenges that they face is the funding. So you are not a typical startup that uh, probably can make money uh, from the early days or even if you can make money, your attractions probably are not very similar to the, some of the startups that uh, VCs are very interested to um, like invest in. So you have this problem. Uh, I mean, now it's easier because refi has become a trend in crypto and VCs are understanding it. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you are now in a beer market, so you will have a hard time to raise uh, some money compared to, I don't know, one year, two years ago. So you have a number of options. Based on our experience and, the exp I mean, the best practices that we had in Treasure, so UNICEF is, of course, uh, one of the places that you can go if you have a crazy impact idea and you think probably, I mean, a crazy impact idea, but not very unrealistic. You think it works, like, uh, and you have some small pilots because if you're in the process of an application, um, UNICEF doesn't accept only the ideas. Like, there should be some metrics, some tractions that proves that this idea, um, even if now it doesn't, um, I mean, um, and it's not a charity. I mean, you need to make a sustainable project. So all these together makes it challenging to actually uh, get funding. So UNICEF is one place. The other place that you have is Gitcoin, um, which you can consider. We raised, uh, I would say, almost equal to the, uh, I mean, similar to the amount that we raised from UNICEF from Gitcoin. I think 85 or $90,000 in different rounds, in climate rounds. And um, there are also, of course, the, I mean, the product, your product should make money. And uh, if, I mean, you want to make it sustainable, that's really important. So all in all, this helped us to keep Treasure in a aligned, uh, um, I mean, keep Tunisia aligned to our vision. And now we, are, we feel much more uh, comfortable to raise money from other VCs. And we are doing it now. And um, that's what I think about, I mean, the challenges and things that you can do. Great. Thank you. Okay. Jose, from your experienced position now, <laughs> what advice would you like to impart on, on early stage startups wanting to get in to kind of follow the great example that you guys have given? I would say impact should be in the roadmap as the essential path. Um, 
I would say that, and I will just share a small uh, meet that I had uh, before we were selected, and uh, it was kind of the spirit of the program. And um, we were like working with the work plan, with the, the plan that we were going to present for the UNICEF Innovation Fund, and uh, it was like too ambitious. And uh, we were asked if we wanted to to change that in order to be fulfillable, so as to achieve it. And uh, our spirit was, let's make the ambitious possible. And that had to do with the spirit of what kept us uh, not sleeping, what kept us working through the whole journey. Um, what I mean to say, it's, it's great to, to have huge objectives in mind a huge purpose not only could help uh, in your region, it starts by helping you and your team. We, we never had uh, such an amazing team, such an aligned team, uh, since we, we didn't add that purpose so clear, so, so, so focus on reaching that. So I strongly recommend, if, if that's possible, uh, for the ones who are trying to to follow that path of impact and, and becoming uh, a startup that could create some change in your region. Have a great dream afterwards, have a great purpose, share it with valuable people and uh, count on the support of like UNICEF in this case that will make this harder at first because it's challenging, but afterwards uh, it start paying and will continue to pay time after time. Great, That's, that sounds like good advice. Uh, Rumi, you give me your advice in one minute, <laughs> please. <laughs> sure, yes. Um, I just wanted to get on, um, I just took Jose's point about they make it harder in the beginning, because when we applied and we had done, we had to do this full-fledged work plan, and as soon as I submitted, I just looked back at my team and I was like, I'm not, I don't know if we're getting this investment, but I think we're set. We have a whole roadmap and a plan and a purpose and a focus all set, so I think that is key to have that process in tight. And uh, I think I completely agree with Jose about that can really set the stage and how the team work and the team is set to do that as well. So I think that's definitely, definitely very, very helpful. I think the one last thing that I would add is um, I felt like for us the non-tech uh, challenges have also been very, very high and I think it's very important to design for, you know, uh, like non-utopian conditions. So we are looking at the real world problems and not just working in a bubble. So I think that's very, very um, important. So I'll pause at that. Perfect, <laughs> thank you very much. Guys, can I ask you for a round of applause for our three great <laughs> companies? And thank you so much for the great work. Now, how can you guys, how can you join us, all the, all the impact uh, startups are out there. I hope you've been inspired by hearing the great work from uh, our three panelists here. Um, please, if you are in the same position that these guys were 18 months, two years ago, please, if you have something that you think can help, apply to the UNICEF Venture Fund and you will be brought through that difficult but rewarding uh, journey. Um, we're also looking for people to uh, partner with us um, and you could also, um, if you have spare time, spare expertise, you could join the, um, the mentoring uh, process that we have for the next round of venture fund companies. And finally, with the last 15 seconds, I'll say if you have a little bit of spare ETH or some spare money, you can certainly contribute to our fund as well. And you can be guaranteed that it will go towards um, impactful projects like uh, what we have up here on stage. I have two seconds left, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the panel. If you have any questions for us, please come up and be happy to speak to you outside or later. Thank you. Thank you.